Well, I'm going to talk about the major continental projects of the Pacific Basin. I'm sure you got the impression. The Pacific Basin is rapidly moving the center of the world community. Well, our emphasis today is to talk about the major projects, especially water and transportation related projects around the Pacific Basin. On the continents around the Pacific Basin, I have selected five major projects. The first one is the Kurok Canal, and somebody else would also talk about it. But I will talk about some of the important aspects of the Kurok Canal, followed by Nicaragua Canal, followed by the Three Gorges Dam, which has been mentioned previously, but I actually personally worked on the Three Gorges Dam starting something like 30 years ago. So I can share. I, Thank you, thank you. I can share my personal experience with you regarding Three Gorges Dam. Let me tell you one thing right now. When the idea was proposed by Dr. Sen and Sen, okay, and later on, well, in China some 30 years ago, it was strongly opposed by certain scientists and engineers because they said, if you travel on the Yangtze River, anybody who has traveled on the Yangtze River, you have noticed the water is muddy. The water is muddy in the summer. In the winter, the only difference is between muddy, muddier, and the muddiest. <laughs> because it is muddy all year round. <laughs> the chairman of Chinese uh, Society of, of Science was opposed to the project. He said, once you build a dam, you're going to slow down the water flow. You're going to induce sediment deposition in the reservoir. Pretty soon, the reservoir, the dam, will become a waterfall. It will become a permanent sorrow for China. <laughs> I will explain to you why the dam will not create a permanent sorrow for China, but in the, in, instead, it's going to bring a lot of benefits okay, from different aspects. Uh, next one, please. Kura Canal is the first major project I wish to mention. If you look at these four routes for Kura Canal, the first one is through Singapore. Well, when the idea of Kura Canal was proposed some 300 years ago, well, Singapore was strongly opposed to the project. Of course, it's going to take everything, all the activities shipping away from Singapore. Well, things have changed. Things have changed for many different reasons. You can look at those four different routes. There's a route, there are two additional routes going through Indonesia. Those are longer routes. But the shortest route is going through Canal, Kara Canal. Kara Canal, the significance of this connects two oceans, the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. The traffic going through Singapore is more than twice the traffic going through Suez Canal and the Panama Canal combined. Okay, that's the significance. And also, the next slide, I'd like to show you some more details for Kura Canal. You can see the difference. Well, there's one route going through Kura Canal. There's another route going through Singapore. Singapore, of course, you have to turn around the Ma Ma Malaysia Peninsula. That is a longer route. And besides, we're beginning to see, next slide, we're beginning to see some problems with the current route. We're having different problems with the current Maluka Strait. It's heavily traveled nowadays, okay? And the congestion is beginning to become a problem. And that's going to increase the cost of shipping, of course. Well, let's see. Now, Maluka Canal, Right now, we have 200,000 ships annually. A more recent estimate is that the traffic of the streets has been increasing at an annual rate of 20%. You know, Mr. LaRouche has brought up this idea, has made the contributions over the years to promote the construction of the new canal, the Kara Canal. Okay, uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Let's take a look of Maluka Canal under its current conditions. We're talking about a width. It's rather small, narrowing width, 1.6 miles. The depth could be as shallow as 25 meters. That's pretty shallow 
especially for those oil tankers nowadays. It's heavily used by oil tankers and bulk carriers. Some 80% Japan's oil supplies go through Malacca Canal. Well, from a security point, those Asian countries, Japan, China, all those countries combined, they are concerned about security of Malacca Canal. If there should be some problems, well, hopefully there's no regional conflicts that can disrupt the oil flow. You know, oil is the lifeline for Japan as well as for China, South Korea, for all those countries. So therefore, if you can open a second route, that would actually improve the security for transportation and the traffic in that region. Next one, please. Of course, the construction of canal would, 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 would stimulate a lot of growth in that area. See, this illustration here shows a commerce industrial development at one end or both ends of the Kara Canal. Well, you know, it could be another Singapore. You know, Singapore is a very affluent country. It's very also a very advanced country. This could be a second Singapore. Although this idea was, was opposed by Singapore, by, in fact, by United Kingdom a long, long time ago because Singapore was a British colony. However, because of other considerations, it is very important that Kara Canal be promoted, be constructed. However, for every project, there are challenges and there are controversies for Kara Canal. Let me tell you the challenges first. It is not feasible to build an elevated canal. It has to be a sea level canal. To build an elevated canal, you need a big body of water because locks and dams do consume a lot of water. So for this canal, now there is no large body of water. There is no lake, okay, along the peninsula to supply the water for the use by Kara Canal. It would be the most logical to build a sea level canal. The sea level has to cut, cut through the mountain range. That is the challenge. Think about this. That involves tremendous amount of expedition and the earth moving. <laughs> Let me say this. That could be the largest earth moving project ever undertaken by man if we build the Kara Canal. Okay, I even have the total expansion, the estimated expenditure for doing that. But, but it is also being contemplated and being considered that we have peaceful use of the nuclear power for the excavation and earth moving for the creation of Kara Canal. Well, you know, recently, next slide, please. Now, China is considering, okay, to call for the construction over 10 years, employing something roughly 30,000 workers, costing between 20 and 25 billion American dollars. That is the latest development, and I don't know any more than that. Of course, you do know now the challenges as well as the controversies involving the Kara Canal. Now, let's move to the next canal, Nicaragua Canal. Well, okay, that will be a second canal connecting the Pacific Atlantic Oceans, the second to the Panama Canal. Well, this idea was suggested as early as three or 400 years ago. Okay, today, many of the super uh, uh, tankers can no longer go through Panama Canal. And the Panama Canal right now does have a traffic congestion. It has become time consuming to go through the canal because it does have to go through a series of locks and dams, right? But they do have freshwater lake that supplies water used by locks and dams. That is the advantage. However, however, now Nicaragua Canal has been determined, has been determined by the business, scientific, industrial community is going to be a useful canal. Once it's completed, it's going to be uh, heavily used because Panama Canal has got limitations and also traffic is getting heavy all the time. 
Now let's take a look of the location of the Nicaragua Canal. Well, you see, you see Nicaragua. We see the location of Panama Canal. We see Costa Rica, Panama. The next country uh, next to Costa Rica is Nicaragua. Let's go to the next slide. Well, this place. Building a canal connecting two no nations, it would involve an elevated, a raised canal for different reasons. Because there's a tidal difference between these two oceans. The tidal difference can be as much as 20 feet. So the water level going through the canal does need to be controlled. And we are going to raise, they're going to raise the water level when the traffic going through the canal. You can see different stages from the slide. You can see different stages, okay? Going through each stage, going through locks and dams, and the raise the canal up, water is supplied by the freshwater lake. Oh, that happens to be a very large lake. The large lake is very important. Well, it makes the canal feasible, but also creates some problems and challenges. You know, Nicaragua Lake is the mother lake for the country of Nicaragua. They are oppos oppositions to heavy ocean-going traffic going through the fresh freshwater lake. In fact, the past president, Ortega, Ortega, he was opposed to the project. He said, now, that freshwater lake is so important. It's the mother of our country. We are not going to allow heavy ocean-going traffic going through this canal. Not only from an environmental aspect, but also from an emotional viewpoint. So that's the current status. Well, have we heard any new recent development? Well, financing wise, does, is anybody interested in building, taking over the big tab, going to go ahead with the construction of the canal? That is estimated roughly to be a $40 billion project. Okay, well, let's see. Well, let me just for first show you the locks and dams. Those going ships, container ships, they go through a series of locks and dams. The water level can be raised, can be lowered, right? So the canal can be raised to a much higher elevation. That water is supplied by Nicaragua, Nicaragua Lake. Okay, I also told you the problems and considerations and the challenges. Well, okay. Let me show you this. There is a reason the proposal. There is a reason the proposal by a gentleman, Mr. Wang. I don't know how real and how realistic this is going to be. He made an announcement. This person has an interesting background. He happens to be a businessman. I think he's stationed in Hong Kong. He is proposing that him provides the financing, 40 billion US dollars for the construction of this canal. But if you look at this picture, okay, in the background of Mr. Wong, it probably raises some eyebrow in Western countries because he remember you of some propaganda. Well, but this gentleman has a very interesting background. He is proposing to do the construction of this canal at a total cost of $40 billion. I do not know the aftermath. It would be very interesting to find out what happens next. But this project, okay, is being considered. And there is indeed a need for the construction of this canal because the traffic problem, because time consuming problem, well, because of the size of the canal problem. Okay. Next, we are moving to the next project. I'm going to talk about the South to North Water Diversion Project in China. This slide here shows the map of China and the United States. These two countries have similarities and have very strong dissimilarities. Same, similar latitude, similar size, except the population densities are very different. China has 1.3 billion people. We only have 300 million people in America. And America is very fortunate because our rainfall, our precipitation occurs from coast to coast, fairly evenly distributed. 
and also not only spatially distributed, but also well distributed seasonally. Seasonal distribution is fairly uniform, spatial distribution is fairly uniform in America. But the rainfall distribution in China is highly, is highly uneven. It is concentrated in the summer and the springtime. Well, and also it's concentrated in the southeast. It becomes very sparse in the northwest. And let's look at this. Let's look at water resources of all the countries in the world. One country that is the most abundant in water resources, guess what, is Brazil. You know, there's a lot of trade between Brazil and China. Brazil said that we have everything China needs. We have water China needs, except we don't know how to sell water to China. Well, Brazil is number one in terms of abundance of water resources, followed by Congo, followed by Indonesia, then United States, then Russia, then China. China is number one in population, but number six, okay, in water resources, which means water distribution, water conservation, water storage becomes very important in that country. Okay, if you look at precipitation pattern in this slide, the next one. Yeah, you can see from the color code, there's much, much more precipitation in the south coastal area, becomes less and less as we go north and toward the west. Well, therefore, but if you look at population distribution, the population distribution is from the south to north. So water becomes much more scarce in the north. That is logical for us to redistribute water from the more abundant area to the less abundant area. That is to divert water from the south to north. Okay, well in the north actually water has become so precious. Next one please. I visited some peasants' families not too long ago. They even collect water in their yard. You see? During the rain they would collect water and the water is stored in the cell. You see? In the cell. That's their water storage tank. They collect rainfall water. This becomes a storage tank for the rainfall water. Next one, please. Now, let's talk about a water diversion project. There are three different routes. The idea is to divert water from the south toward the north. There's the east route. Okay, the east route is taking water from the Yangtze River to the north, to the city, the harbor city of Tianjin. The center route is also taking water from the uh, a tributary of the of the Yellow River, uh, the Yangtze River, also to Beijing, and the western route is to take the water from near the Tibetan Plateau, divert water from the Yangtze River to the Yellow River. Now these three routes, let me see, combined will take roughly 7% of the water from the Yangtze River Basin to the north, to the Yellow River Basin. Okay, 7%. Well, well, let's take a look, more details of the eastern route. The eastern route starting from the Yangtze River, next one please. Yeah, you see, three different phases. Phase one starting from the south, then going through the center, and there's a tributary all going to the, to the peninsula, to the tip of the peninsula, and all the way to Tianjin, to the harbor city of Tianjin. Well, these are the routes. It goes through a series of lakes, and uh, you can see that this part is already completed. The intake station at the Yangtze River, this part is already construct, uh, completed. Okay, this is a picture of completed water intake. That's where water is taken from the Yangtze River and uh, then sent it toward the north. Uh, next one, please. Okay, this shows the canal. This is the ancient canal, which has been improved, enlarged, and deepened to improve, to increase its capacity for transporting water from the south toward the north. Well, the next one, please. This is the tunnel under the Yellow River. Those are very, very huge tunnels, which takes the water, okay, under the river to send the water toward the north. 
the eastern route, where you take water from the south to the north, it has got a number of pumping stations to cross the Yellow River. You know, Yellow River is not a point of water concentration. Yellow River is a point of water divide. You know why? Because Yellow River is an elevated waterway. Yellow River has a heavy sediment content. Over the years, people building up the levee, year after year, generation after generation, the riverbed of Yellow River is much higher above the adjacent fields. So when the water goes from the Yenzi River through the Yellow River to the north, it has to go through a series of pumping stations. And after passing the Yellow River, that water would flow down by gravity all the way to the city of Tianjin. Okay, the western, uh, the next slide please. The western route, of course, would take with water actually, that's very, very impressive because that area is so mountainous, it has to go through so many mountains, goes through so many river valleys. That is perhaps the most mountainous area. It's right on the edge, edge of the Tibetan Plateau. Well, so that is going to give a very large expenditure. Here's one, 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 one picture. Next one, please. Yeah, you can see the picture. You see the route of the diversion canal. Well, it's going to be by canals, by pumps, and also by tunnels, going through many tunnels, going through a series of reservoirs. That construction would be very difficult because that area has got so many high mountains. Do you know the average elevation for Tibetan Plateau? The average elevation is 5,000 meters. Yeah. Well, I remember just a few years ago, I had a chance to visit Tibet. I actually stayed in the tallest hotel, okay, at the highest city of the world, according to Guinness Book of World Records. <laughs> well, that hotel has an altitude of 15,000 feet. I can feel, I can feel the difficulty in breathing. And also, you know, the pressure is so low. Well, people told me if you boil water, boil boils not at 100 degrees Celsius, but at 69 degrees Celsius. Then I asked them, how do you, how you, how do you, how do you cook, right? You, you may not be able to cook, fully cook a food, the temperature, because it boils at such a low temperature. They said, no problem, we got pressure cookers. <laughs> so, with the pressure cookers, you can solve over, overcome that problem. Well, that's my personal experience. By the way, it was very difficult because it becomes very strenuous. You know, when I was walking down, walking up the steps, every after every five steps, I got to stop for a while just to catch up with my breath. So think about the construction of this. Think about the construction of this this water diversion system. This project has not been started. Well, you may wish to know the status of the three lines for water diversion. The eastern route, okay, is on the way to com completion. I say maybe in a couple years, because they started that project something like uh, oh, five or ten years, maybe ten years ago. The center route is also near completion. In another two, three years, that route will be completed. What about the cost for construction? The eastern route and the center route for water diversion. The total cost is 60 billion US dollars. Ah, and also involves the resettlement of people. They have to resettle 600,000 people for the construction of these two diversion routes. That is a very difficult task, right? In a country like that, they can still do it. But in this country, if we want to resettle not 600,000, but 6,000 people, I think it's an impossibility, right? Well, <laughs> I don't know how to say I don't know how to say that, of course. We have a lot of difficulty. I, you know, I live in San Diego. I remember when they built Highway 56. It took them 26 years since the <laughs> to, from, the, from the time of planning to the time of completion. It took them exactly 26 years for the completion of the freeway. Right? There was a lot of lawsuits, eminent domain, land use, land acquisition. Yeah. 
You know what? Ever since the communist revolution, there's no private ownership of land. So the government owns the land, right? That makes a lot easier for public works. <laughs> well, Tibetan Plateau. Okay, they had this opening ceremony for the construction of this canal, uh, a diversion project. Next slide, please. I want to talk about three gorgeous dams. As I told you, I started working on this project some 30 years ago. This project was first proposed, envisioned by Dr. Sun Yat-sen, that Nanny just mentioned. Okay, he really had the vision. He said, we are going to get this inspiration and this idea from the TVA project. You know TVA. TVA has a network of dams and hydropower stations generate tremendous amount of hydropower. And this project has many benefits. Well, this one shows the, the completed dam now. It shows a completed dam. Well, uh, a picture taken from a satellite. Next one, please. Yeah, this is a close-up of the project, showing the completed project. Next one, please. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see a picture taken from the satellite. Well, uh, this picture, well, let's look at the picture. <laughs> you know, you see uh, that water was released through these sluice gates. You notice this water is muddy, as I mentioned to you. When this project was proposed, okay, there was a lot of opposition, including the president of the Chinese Academy of Science. He said, the water is so muddy, and sooner or later, as the velocity slows down in the reservoir, that reservoir is going to be filled up with sediment eventually. If not in 100 years, perhaps in 500 years. So that reservoir is going to become a waterfall. Its function will be lost, and that's become a permanent sorrow for China. Well, our mission was very simple. Our mission was to determine how to control the reservoir, to design the reservoir, to build a reservoir such that the capacity of the reservoir can be preserved in perpetuity. That was our mission. Oh, there was all kinds of studies. There were physical modeling studies. They built physical modeling in a laboratory to find out how the reservoir behaves once water and the sediment is released and pulling through the reservoir. And there was also computer modeling of flood flow going through the reservoirs. The part I got involved was computer modeling of water and sediment flow going through reservoirs. But I can tell you very briefly, because if I have to give you the details, that may take a couple hours. But I can tell you very briefly, very briefly, okay, this reservoir will be sealed it up. But deposition of sediment in the reservoir would only take away roughly 40% of the reservoir capacity in the very long term. 60% of the capacity of the reservoir will be preserved in perpetuity. Then the question is, how do you say that? Why do you think that's true? Well, I can tell you very briefly, there are many reasons why that is going to be true. Now, this reservoir, it's very different from Lake Mead. Many of you have seen Lake Mead, right? If you stand on top of Lake Mead, Hoover Dam, overlooking Lake Mead, looking at Lake Mead, you'll notice the water is clear. It's clear water, right? You know what message I get? No sediment can escape Lake Mead. All the sediment would settle in Lake Mead. However, if you look at this picture here, you see the water is still, even the outflow water is muddy. Now, that's because Lake Mead is a storage reservoir. It's round in shape, and this reservoir is a river reservoir. It's a long and a narrow reservoir. It's a reservoir on a river channel. That's one thing. For the second, there's a flow. The flow would always move sediment. When the reservoir is sealed up, People would think the reservoir will become shallower and shallower. Sediment builds up from the bottom, right? Sediment builds from the bottom of the reservoir. The water will become shallower and shallower. Not so. You know what really happens? 
From physical modeling, from mathematical computer modeling, we found out sediment deposition will be basically along the banks, which means the reservoir eventually will become narrower, but still as deep, almost as deep as it is today. In other words, once the reservoir seals up, it will become more like a river channel because the siltation will simply reduce the width of the reservoir, not so much the depth of the reservoir. And so long as there's a flow, the flow would always make a channel going through the river, reservoir. And the flow of the Yangtze River is tremendous. That flow itself will always preserve the capacity of the reservoir. OK, let's take a picture. Some of the pictures of the sluice water, flood water going through the sluice gate of the reservoir. OK, let's take a look. Now, now this is what I downloaded from their official news site. The next one, please. You can see the tremendous amount of water flowing in through the reservoirs, going through the sluice gates. Wow, another picture. Next one. Yes, next one, please. OK, next one. Well, you see, I was there only two years ago. I was there two years ago. You know what happened? <laughs> when I was out there, there was, a, there was a record drought in that area, just downstream of the reservoir. You know what they blame? You know what the people blame? It's the reservoir, the Three Gorges Dam, that actually caused a major drought, record drought, in the area downstream of the reservoir. In other words, it is people's opinion the construction of the dam and the reservoir has changed the climate, the precipitation pattern of the Yangtze River Basin. Well, I'll tell you what. This point was not addressed in the environmental impact report. I cannot relate the change in precipitation pattern to the presence of the reservoir. You know, people have wild ideas. Let me tell you another wild idea. During the planning staging of the dam, People want to study the impact of the reservoir to the dam. They said how the reservoir and the dam is going to change the Earth's rotation. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, was very, that was very good for as, as a topic for EIR, right? Nowadays, we do a lot of EIR. Well, keep engineer scientists busy. OK, next one. OK. Uh, yeah, yeah, this is inside. Uh, visitors to visit the dam and uh, the power plant could not get in because we were guests of the Chinese Water Resources Bureau. So we had the privilege of getting in. You now this is a power a powerhouse. You see the, the, uh, the, the generator. You see the top part is the generator, generator driven by those turbines. The turbine is submerged in water, right? Okay, now let's take a look. Let's take a look of this project, different pictures. I see, oh, by the way, uh, I mentioned to you when they built this reservoir in the dam, they did a physical modeling study in an indoor laboratory. I couldn't believe the size of the indoor physical model. I've never seen such a super laboratory, indoor laboratory in my, in, in my, in my career. You know, we have a lot of laboratories, hydraulics laboratories, the largest one being uh, Vicksburg, Mississippi, Waterways Experiment Station, Army Corps of Engineers. But they are not even one third the size of this indoor, res uh, indoor laboratory in China used for the study of the Yangtze River and the Three Gorges Dam. OK, you can see the inside of the laboratory. And let's look at the project benefits. Uh, the major benefits of hydropower is quite apparent because the energy is very cheap. I want to give you one example. You know that San Onofre in San Diego County, Diablo Canyon? We have two nuclear power stations, right? Now, San Onofre is 2.2 gigawatts. The revenue it gets, so 10 years ago, I know, every day, that energy sells for $2.2 million every day, sells for $2.2 million. But to run that nuclear power plant, the expense, the expense is very high, is $2 million. So the profit margin is very small. Why? 
because nuclear power plants has very, very strict security measures. There are 3,000 people working at a power plant, many of them working on the subject, on the aspect of security, nuclear power security. But what about energy? Hydropower, you know, on the Feather River in Northern California, that Feather River has got three-stage power generating stations. They produce one gigawatt, equivalent to one nuclear power plant. So their, 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 their revenue, it generates like $1 million per day. What about expense? The bank's expense approaches zero. Why? Because for hydropower, the fuel is free. You don't pay for the fuel. You don't pay the transportation of the fuel. They only have 16 people working that entire canyon. The salary expense is very, very small. So you can see right away that is a very cheap energy. Okay, well, there are many, many benefits, but I want to mention something else. I want to show you one slide which compares all the hydropower generating stations in the world. Okay, you can see this table, right? It shows the radiant capacity and the hydropower dams and the country to which it belongs. Three Gorgeous Dam has a capacity of 17.6 gigawatts. That's by far the largest hydropower station in the world, followed by Guri in Venezuela, Itapu in Brazil, Grand Coulee Dam in the state of Washington. That's 6.4 gigawatts. That's the capacity of Grand Coulee Dam. Okay, well, what about Hoover Dam? Hoover Dam is not on the list, okay? But Hoover Dam is so important for the energy supply of Southern California. Well, let's see. What is one gigawatt? Do we have any ideas? One gigawatt normally is a typical capacity of one nuclear power plant. So give you some ideas. Three Gorges Dam has a rated capacity roughly equivalent to 17.6 nuclear power plants. That's the capacity of Three Gorges Dam. You know how much revenue it generates using 10 years price? They generate something like $17.6 million a day. That's the energy it produces per day. What about expense for producing energy? Well, the construction expense was very high, but the operating expense is very low because you don't have all the safety regulations as nuclear power plant does. So therefore, the advantages of hydropower is apparent. Nawapa. Okay, I want to go quickly to Nawapa. This really is the vision of the North American continent as well as the world community because this network of water distribution system, you know, reservoirs, dams, channels, pipes, culverts, and so forth, redistribute water from the abundant area to the water scarce area. That's gonna generate so much wealth in North America. And let me see this. Nawapa is the vision of the future. Now, WAPA will have a lot of pumping stations, right? You have to pump water up, you have to let water go down. But once water is pumped up, when the water comes down, they also drive hydro turbines. Energy is also generated by the water distribution system of Nawapa. They are building the water supply system to Southern California. They have pumping stations. At the same time, they have a lot of hydropower generation stations. Because whenever it goes up, they pump the water up. Whenever the water goes down, they actually generate power. You know, in the Republic of France, they try to minimize the use of nuclear power. In fact, I don't, be, oh, no, no, no. They have, they have the maximum use of nuclear power in France. Germany is trying to minimize the use of nuclear power. But France has extensive use of nuclear power. But you see, nuclear power, nuclear energy is produced at a constant rate. You cannot adjust the rate. You cannot adjust the power rate, I mean, right away. 
Sometimes they produce too much energy, sometimes they don't produce enough energy. So whenever they produce too much energy, that energy is to be stored. How do they store the surplus nuclear energy? Batteries? We don't have batteries of that size. That batteries would be at such tremendous capacity, right? Let me say this, reservoirs is nature's battery. They pump the water up into reservoirs. Okay, that's where energy is stored. Whenever they need this additional energy, that water comes down from the reservoir through the hydro turbines to generate energy. So batteries are nature's, okay? Not all reservoirs are nature's batteries for energy storage. Well, uh, I, I think this picture again shows the the Nawaba project, I simply cannot help to think. Now, whoever came up with this idea, always, you know, it starts from the 60s, had a tremendous vision. And this is the cause we are striving for. We hope someday Nawaba will be realized. Okay, so I think for the sake of time, if we we'll just maybe take one question, does anyone have a burning question for Dr. Chen? Are there Chen? any plans of using desaltation as a means of getting water? I built desaltation plants in just about all the refineries in LA. We use water from the ocean, remove the salt, and use it for industrial grade water to use on the cooling towers. With a little bit more refining, it could be turned into potable water. Yeah, that's a very good question. You know, desalination is the way to go in many countries. Israel, Saudi Arabia has a lot of desalination plants, but it is also energy intensive. It does cost a lot of energy. I want to give you one example for the cost of generating desalinized water. Now, a, a, a desalination plant has just recently approved for construction in the county of San Diego in the city of Carlsbad. They're going to take water from that Betty Gillos Lagoon, going through os reverse osmosis to produce, you know, desalinize the water. Uh, they want to sell that project to San Diego, or uh, say, San Diego County Water Authority. Water Authority made a calculation of the cost for desalination. They found out water produced by desalination has a price tag twice as much as the water we import from the Colorado River. But as far as I know, that, that project is a very big project. It's gonna produce something like a five, almost 5% of water need for the county of San Diego. And I believe that's also the first approved major project in the state of California. And for many countries, that's the only choice. For Israel, that's the only choice. For Saudi Arabia, where energy is very cheap, of course, that's a logical choice. So that's as much as I know about the desalination. One, uh, I have one quick question. Sure. And that has to do with, since my, one of my undergraduate degrees is in zoology, that when we store energy in a body of water, we increase the temperature of that body of water. And I'm wondering about the ecology of that environment. Water, if we store water in a body of water, we increase the temperature, we may increase a lower temperature of the body of water. Now, it really depends on the water we import, right? The ocean water is on the, uh, well, right now the ocean water is about uh, 65 degrees along the Pacific coast. So if we import that water, that water I think could be, well, it's pretty comparable to the fresh water in, for, in, for, for lakes on land. Yeah, so it really depends on, on, on the on temperature difference. It could increase the temperature, it could decrease the temperature. But for a smaller body of water, the temperature can change more rapidly. For a large body of water, such as the ocean, the water, the temperature does not change very fast because it takes a lot of heat to change the temperature, yeah. <laughs> Hello. 
Okay, uh, I noticed that in the picture that you had um, of Nicaragua. Nicaragua. Nicaragua uh -huh. And I noticed that one of the cities that was not too far from that, uh, to the north of the canal, uh -huh. uh, was Managua. And um, I was just curious to know how you would deal with the fact that there are so many very bad earthquakes in that area. Would the, yeah. um, and I know that's something you have to consider when you're building. Um, would you somehow or another go over the fault, or would you actually have to dig through that fault to well, deal with that? That's a real concern. Earthquakes would be a real concern. Yeah. Earthquake would be a real concern for all the dams. Mm -hmm. You notice mm -hmm. there are dam failures happening in history. In yeah. fact, in recent decades in northern Italy, that's earthquake zone. Some of the arch dam actually failed. But uh, it really depends on your, your uh, hydraulic engineering projects. Certain canals can take some degree of earthquake. Certain canals cannot take. Certain dams, such as Earthfield Dam, Gravity Dam, can sustain certain earthquakes. Concrete Dam, Arch Dam, simply are very vulnerable to earthquake damages. So I'm sure engineers would have solved that problem if they built a Nicaragua Canal. That earthquake, I would say, is a major concern. They must take some precautionary measures in connection with the construction of the canal. The way that border was, uh -huh. you seem to be on the border. You're going through that lake, but it looks like the border looked a little safer to go down there, but okay, whatever. <laughs> you know, okay, thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, I would just like to, it's the gentleman who asked about desalination, yeah, you're there. Uh, because I wanted to address that too. Because I was very excited when we, um, when we discussed the, uh, writing the special report on the Eurasian land bridge, we discussed very much the question about desalination. And uh, the calculations were made that if, you, if we produce as much, I mean, there's, I just want to get the concept across that there is absolutely nothing we cannot do if we put our mind to doing it. And the calculations we made at that time, and that was 1997, was that if we produced the same amount of energy that Germany at that time produced per year, then we could produce as much uh, desalinated water as you have in the Rhine River. And the Rhine River is a big, broad river. So it's a lot of water. Uh, I want to give another example concerning LaRouche's vision. Remember, um, Dr. Ding from Beijing said that uh, LaRouche was far-sighted, and first later they realized how right LaRouche was. In 1978, I was running for mayor of Copenhagen, and I asked LaRouche, so what do you think should be my program? And he said, take all the uh, shipbuilding uh, uh, yards that you have in southern Sweden, southern, Nor uh, northern, northern, Sweden, uh, southern Sweden, southern Norway, and in Denmark. And what you do is you pro uh, pr we propose a program for, for retooling all the shipyards in that area to become assembly plants for producing floating nuclear power plants on assembly line using the different shipyards, and then we float them down to Africa. And as a young woman at the time, I thought there was a fantastic program. And now the Russians have begun to produce the floating nuclear power plants uh, in the north of Russia. I'm saying this because there is a, uh, because we have had a decline since Kennedy was assassinated. It's like, we can do a little bit here and a little bit there. It'll be good with a canal here and a canal there and a dam here. When we first have a shift, what Helga LaRousse has called for, a total paradigm shift, when we don't, go, when we don't bow down any longer to oligarchical thinking and monetary thinking, we will take off like a rocket. We'll take off the way we will do the impossible, what seems to be the impossible, like when Kennedy said, that we are going to go to the moon before the end of the decade. And he said, I don't know how we're going to get there, but we are going to get there. When we first have a collaboration among nations of Russia, China, the United States, with a Glass-Steagall and a complete shift, 
we, can, we will take off, we will produce nuclear power plants on assembly lines much better, much more efficient, very cheap, and launch into a fusion age. This is what we should have done a long time ago. So uh, I just, this is the kind of thinking that LaRouche, Lyndon and Helga LaRouche uh, think about when they start to talk about a paradigm. And that's what we are looking at. Uh, we are not looking at this last 50 years. We are looking at a complete shift to the American way globally. And that shift will uh, make an uptick for the enti entire world. And when we first begin to develop, it doesn't go like this, it goes like this, um, concerning uh, an acceleration and a leap in development. So I just want to make that point. There's nothing we cannot do.